Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Today we're looking at the Leaping Demon, also known as the Balgura. Balgura. They were one of the many new demons that debuted in the model module Lost Caverns of Sojanth in 1982 and then appeared in the first edition Monster Manual 2 the following year under the demon entry. This book uh, is also significant because the Monster Manual 2 also included the demons or the daemons who would later be known as the Yugoloths and the Demodans of Tartarus which uh, haven't actually had a lot of modern day cover so I'm going to be doing some videos about them as well. Well, it's also uh, established that demons could freely cross over from their own abyssal layers into the plains of Tartarus, Hades or Pandemonium. Plus, they could move around in the astral plane. But they were prevented from crossing into the prime material plane without aid from another power. So being summoned there or making use of an existing portal was the only way they could cross into the prime material material plane. The original entry of the Leaping Demon says that the Baal Gura is similar to an orangutan except for its gruesome visage and long canine teeth. Its six-fingered hands and feet also have exceptionally long claws, but they don't typically use those in battle. They scramble along the ground, but are much faster and more nimble in the tree branches, uh, or moving among building rafters or ships rigging, or where there are plenty of ropes or vines for it to move around rapidly about. They also are named for their ability to spring from all fours and cover 40 feet in one running leap. They also have a range of spell-like powers that they could employ, such as in the old edition, uh, the original version, they had a 10-foot areas of darkness, uh, causing fear by touch attack, dispelling magic, detecting illusions and invisibility, causing plants to grow and entangle creatures, as well as teleporting and using telekinesis. Those were all essentially cantrips to these demons, plus twice per day they could polymorph themselves, turn invisible or use phantasmal force. Also, when under a threat, they had a 25% chance of gating in another of their kind to help them. 25% chance is actually pretty high when you're rolling the dice. Their modern 5th edition version can cast Disguise Self and Invisibility on itself on only uh, twice per day. They can also cast Entangle and Phant Phantasmal Force once per day. But if you wanted to create some more capable and threatening Baral Gura leaders or champions, we have an existing framework to provide them with some more spell-like powers, at least from the older editions. Plus, it seems uh, that they've lost their ability to teleport, which is interesting. The Baal Gura have always had excellent vision, able to see 120 feet in darkness, plus they have blind sight out to 30 feet and passive perception of 15. The blind sight basically represents that they've got heightened senses and reflexes because they've been conditioned in a brutal environment of ultraviolence, which I'll talk about later. When it desires, a barrel gura can change its coloration to any of the following hues. Uh, black, brown, grey, green, orange, purple or red, which is something that you don't see in the modern version but was definitely present in the original. This transformation requires one round and they use this to better blend in with their local environment when they're hunting down prey. Normal weapons have always had full effect on this type of demon. They're not immune to mundane weapons. They are resistant to cold, fire and lightning damage, plus totally immune to poison and Poison is the only damage type that they are completely immune to. They are known to shun most other demons. They prefer to hunt and terrorize with their own kind unless compelled to be in the presence of other demons, in which case they will always bully, order about and manipulate the less intelligent and usually attempt to contravene the desires of greater demons. They don't have a particularly high intelligence themselves. They're mostly all about the animal cunning. In combat, they are savage, ferocious and fight without regard for their own safety. They gain a trait called reckless in 5th edition, so at the start of the turn, the Baral Gura can gain advantage on all melee attack rolls it makes during the turn, but attack rolls against it have advantage until the start of its next turn, so essentially raging. They can also leap 20 feet high in the air with a short running start, so they will frequently combine reckless attacks with their exceptionally acrobatic leaps, as well as their fast ground movement and rapid climbing speed. Uh, they've got a climbing speed of 30 feet, as which is equal to their ground... Uh, uh, speed as well so they can certainly dash when climbing as well when you do when they do pounce and attack it is with two slamming fists and their powerful tusked bite 
They are plus 7 to hit, and the bite does 2d6 plus 4 piercing damage. The fists do 1d10 plus 4 bludgeoning damage, but they are more than capable of using melee weapons or ranged weapons, particularly throwing weapons and bludgeoning weapons. If they are equipped in order to do so, they just don't normally rely on anything that gets in the way of their ability to outmaneuver their enemies, so they don't carry around a bulky amount of armor and weapons and things if they have the capacity to jump and leap into trees or canopies or other areas that they can hide. If the Barrel Gura are forced to go into some sort of mass combat with nothing to climb on, um, or precious little cover to leap out of in an ambush attack, they will certainly employ armor and weapons. Even if it's just thing that they, things that they pick up from the battlefield, hurling spears, axes, even swords or shields at the enemy. If you're running a game with friends who enjoy more juvenile humor, these demon apes are quite capable of throwing something else particularly vile at the enemy, if you know what I mean demonic levels of ickiness. Looking at the skill bonuses, particularly uh, those listed in 5th edition, they have excellent saving throws against dexterity and constitution effects. They have exceptional physiques. They are large, hulking beasts, only about 8 foot tall due to their normally crouched stance, but almost as wide as they are tall with massive musculature, weighing in at least 650 pounds. They have completely blood red eyes, and like most demons, they speak abyssal, which is a horrible language that sounds more like a collection of nasty sounds than any actual meaningful words and sentences, at least to the human ear. When communicating with non-demons, they'll simply use their 120 foot telepathy. They are reasonably tough, with an armor class of 15 and an average of just under 70 hit points, which makes them a real threat. Uh, but what makes them a real threat is their magical abilities, their tendency to strike from a position both out of reach and out of sight, and they tend to form groups. It's rare to find a Baraglura all alone, more so than most other types of demons. They actually gather into tribes. Uh, they do this because they need to survive in their native environment. The lore of the Baral Gurus is fairly interesting. They are most often associated with Demogorgon these days, but originally they served a different demon lord, many still do, uh, which is Ilsidahur. Il He's a demon lord called the Howling King. He claimed rulership over them and was served by Nalfeshnis as well. Ilsidahur made his debut in Dungeon Magazine number 10 in the adventure The Shrine of Ilsidahur, written by John Nephew in 1988. The adventure for 4 to 6 characters of level 3 to 6 is a compact one shot which took place in the, the uh, an abandoned temple located in the Armedio jungle in the world of Greyhawk. Ilsidahur appears as a 12 foot tall ape with a long pink and hairless prehensile tail and bronze ram-like horns, curled ram-like horns that he butts with instead of gores. He particularly prizes objects made of bronze and eating the flesh of demi-humans, which is dwarves, elves, halflings, and gnomes. It is assumed his lair, which is called the Guttering Grove, is a jungle realm filled with Baral Gurus, Nalfeshtis, and other simian monsters. Well, that was fleshed out later on in the, uh, the Guide to the Abyss, which was published in um, the Fiendish Codex. The Abyss, published in uh, 3.5 edition. Demogorgon, as with most things, acquired the servitude of the Gabal Gurus by brute force conquest. The 90th layer is considered close by to Demogorgon's own realms, and is kind of a, it's a part of those realms, actually. It is home to El Sidahur, plus the original environment that spawned the demon apes. In this nightmare jungle, they rove in brutal tribes, constantly hunting and taking down other monstrous beasts found in the jungles, taking their heads and decorating their territory with them as grim trophies and warnings to rival Barrel Euro tribes. The troglodytes who worship Demogorgon under one of his many names, for them he is, uh, and the Bar Ilguras, he is Amon Ibor, the sibilant beast who uses his teachings to bring vile intelligence and fanaticism to the beasts of the wild. The Baral Gurus are the demon heart of the savage jungle. They make excellent scouts, and their ability to work together in a pack means that they are very capable of taking down significantly more powerful creatures than themselves. Demogorgon resides on some of the time in this, his abyssal layer in the abyss, which is number 88, the Gaping Moor, where vast ocean meets storm-lashed sea cliffs and vast steaming salt flats, bogs, and feral marshland. But where the ground hardens, the predatory jungle tree canopy grows dangerously lush, casting the land in deep shadows. Here are enormous dinosaurs battle for territory with dire apes and Barugulras. Lost uh, a lost plateau deep in the mainland is said to hold a two-way portal to the Guttering Grove, the 90th layer of the Abyss and realm of Ilsidahur. 
patron of the Barrel Gura. The forest is named for the constantly keening fiendish monkeys, lemurs and apes who dwell within and below its leafy canopy. And bear in mind, not a single stretch of this jungle is in any way safe. Even for such formidable and savage pack hunters, the attrition rate of the Barogluras is atrocious and only the strongest survive. With razor sharp re- uh, reflexes and senses and uh, keen abilities to, to uh, avoid and overwhelm dangers. The capacity to launch into frenzied explosive violence at any moment and with the least amount of provocation. Of course, Demogorgon encourages this kind of condition and the 88th layer of the abyss sees a constant influx of the most brutally violent beasts and humanoids from across the plains, resulting in places like the ruinous stone ziggurat city of Lemoriax, the capital of the Gaping Moor, which is basically in a constant state of feral mob violence, with the streets slick from a constant splattering of blood, uh, enough to run like a clotted creek down the the lower avenues. Um, And of course the sound of the place is just a riotous a uh, ruinous cacophony of fighting and brutality and revelry. When using Barugurals Igur, in your game, I suggest you employ them as pack, a pack hunting group. Perhaps one of them will spring out of hiding and give someone the bash, then leap away again, while the players are getting organised into a position to fight this beast, when t- one or out of two or three different directions a mob of the demons will leap at them each time the player character is losing sight of the demons they lose some measure of tactical control and the barrel girls may keep attacking with advantage if they are in a favorable environment for their hit and fade strategy they can hurl improvised weapons from a distance use spells to disorientate and break up the group of adventurers they can use invisibility to sneak in amongst them even grab somebody and leap away they're quite capable of picking up targets and leaping far across their encounter area where they can be ganged up on and beaten to death fairly quickly because they coordinate using barking and screeching in their abyssal language. If you wanted to further enhance the threat of these demons for higher level play and do this with caution, consider giving them the pack tactics trait but be very careful with how many there are in the attacking mobs as numbers significantly increase the challenge to any encounter in 5th edition. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so for access to all the scripts of these videos and special priority access to me, including being able to request specific video content. Consider becoming a patron of the channel on Patreon. How much you choose to support me is entirely um, in your control. Join the community on our Discord server, come say hi. Also, absolutely comment down below, as I frequently am told I'm one of the most engaging and active YouTube D&D content creators, so expect me to reply to any questions you might have. Also, for further support, check out the other links in the video description text. You can pick up some nice deals, um, some tasty threads, and help me out in the process. Also, check out that there's a new store down there, which is uh, an exclusive Talency store, with some other products which are going to be arriving there soon. As always... Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.